It is Monday, April 23rd. We are getting back on the record in State versus Guy, 17 SC 153902. The jurors started deliberations around 9 this morning. Deputy yes. Murphy? Yes, sir. Great, round 9. It is 10 minutes to 11. And maybe 10 minutes ago, uh, I had three more questions from the jury uh, brought out to me. I'm going to read them into the record. The defense and the state have copies of them. This line hopefully made copies of the three note cards. So I believe both sides um, have the questions. Uh, and I've numbered them just so we can distinguish them. What I'm calling question six reads, how does intent affect the charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon? As a follow-up to that is question seven. For an assault to occur, does there need to be intent to cause violent injury or just an action that causes violent injury? Question eight. Misleading conduct. Does this mean the person who is subjected to the offense needs to be tricked into performing an action? Or does it mean that the subject just needs to be asked to do or say something? Good morning, Mr. Rucker. Good morning, Judge. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. Uh, tell me what you think I ought to do in connection with these three questions. <clears throat> um, I know that each of the um, jurors has its own individual copy of charge. Um, and it seems as though they are um, um, perhaps struggling with some of the language. I know the court um, told them that there tends to be some archaic uh, legalese that's contained within the charge. Uh, and it seems as though they want to receive um, more instructions about the concept of intent, at least with respect to six and seven. And uh, my recommendation to the court would be to bring them out and just simply recharge them um, verbally um, on um, assault, um, intent, and aggravated assault with respect to six and seven. Okay. And eight? And eight. Um, the answer is I'm, neither. Right, right. And I'm struggling with how the court could perhaps answer that without piercing into the province of what we've kind of asked them to do. Um, and I don't know if simply rereading um, the, the actual indicted charge itself would inform them. Um, if they had added one more word yeah. to the card, I think I could provide a more meaningful answer. If, right. if it had ended with, does it mean that the subject just needs to be asked to do or say something misleading or I told, but it just says say something. Um, or do something. That's what it says. Um, so let me hear from Mr. Samuel and then I'll circle yeah. back with yeah. you. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Samuel. Good morning. I don't entirely disagree with the uh, suggestion with regard to aggravated assault, but I do think you should use, you should start with some plain English which is that the answer to the question is yes, with or without an explanation point. Yes, these crimes require intent to commit an assault, not just 
the doing of an action. So with regard to questions as you call them, uh, seven, six, or six and seven, um, I would suggest that you, you know, I have a different page numbers than what you gave them. Yeah. So, but your instruction definition of a crime includes the essential element of intent. At least according to my draft, the very next clause is intent, which begins with intent is an essential element of any crime and must be proved by the state beyond reasonable doubt. And then the next sentence answers that question. Well, no, sorry, next sentence. Next sentence is criminal intent is not the intent to violate the law, but the intent to commit the act that is prohibited. So I, I but I think the simple way to answer six and seven is, and are they different? Do you, do you see the difference between six and seven? Um, I, I, I do, um, but they're clearly closely related. Um, and it may be, we don't know the chronology of the writing, that they wrote six, which is, how does intent affect it? And they said, wait a minute, what does that question mean? Yeah. But um, they're clearly connected, they're focused on intent um, right. in connection with aggravated assault and assault. I mean, they even went deeper down to say, well, wait a minute, Aggravated assault is a species of assault. Um, do you have to mean to, what do you have to intend right. to get there? Right. So I think the answer is you have to intend to commit the assault, you have to intend that it be done with a deadly weapon. You must intend to do that. And then you can either read the charge or say, in this connection, I would suggest that you refer to the instructions as follows. And if you'll give the correct page number to the correct head. With regard to the question dealing with count five. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with your your statement that had they added a word or two, it would have been easy. It, it, maybe so, but I doubt we had the same solution. Um, obviously, our position, and I think the law is absolutely clear on this, is yes, you must meet, mislead the witness, not just ask. You must mislead the witness. You say that in the charge, but they obviously don't understand what that means. So, or, or they're not, they're, they're having difficult with this statute, which we have been all struggling with. Right. And we have suggested in the defendant's original request number three that you elaborate because it is such a confusing statute. And so I think what you ought to do is look back at our defendant's exhibit three. I know you thought it was too much. It was any paragraph that begins, in other words, as you said, means that there was something wrong with the previous paragraph. And that may very well be true. But I think what you need to instruct this jury is, one thing's for sure, asking someone to lie is not enough. You must, the, the perpetrator, the defendant, the accused, must mislead the witness. Now, we can all have different interpretations, and we do, of what it means to mislead a witness. But you must mislead the witness in order to achieve a result. You must intend to mislead the witness. Well, intent isn't focus, but yes. Okay. You must attempt to mislead or intent. Right. Well, and, and I think we had a good discussion now many, many, many days ago about like, the way this is charged. You can't have an attempt um, uh, either because the crime itself is, forget, that's not their question. Right. We don't have to revisit that, that complexity problem. But, I'm trying to pull up the jury charge here that they have. That's what I'm looking at. It's one that's coming. You just read the, you just read the statute. That's all you did. No, I, I remember that. I'm trying to pull up the whole charge so okay. that um, I can decide whether um, they need to come out here or if I can um, simply say maybe one or two lines in writing and then refer them to certain pages in there or if they need to come out. So let me look at the charge. charge that they have, which is what you have, the pagination may be slightly different. Um, I, I think um, that at least as a start, um, it is um, sufficient and appropriate um, to um, refer them to the definition of a crime and intent charges, which are on page six of what they've got. The aggravated assault charge, which is on page nine, the intent scenarios, pages 10 through 11, and then reading influencing witnesses, as much as it is a 
a lonely single sentence, it engages in misleading conduct toward another with intent to da, da, da. It, it, I appreciate that they seem confused by it, but it doesn't say that the person needs to be tricked. Um, and it certainly doesn't say that the person just needs to be asked to do something. That the, the gravamen of the offense is that they would need to find that Mr. McGuire engaged in misleading conduct towards someone else with this intent that he had. He was trying to keep that someone else from not communicating X, Y, and Z. I think given the facts of count five, that part is not the complicated part, what he was trying to prevent. It's the first part. Um, and is it misleading conduct to do whatever it is they're deciding he did? Here's the problem, as I see it. second half of their step says, or does it mean that the subject just needs to be asked to do or say something? The answer to that is absolutely no. That's not enough. And the confusion is because of the title of this jury instruction and the first sentence of the jury instruction. We asked you back then, and we ask you again now. The first sentence, it's only one sentence. It says influencing witnesses. That's the problem. You've taken the, the, the title of the code section which itself, excuse the pun, is misleading because we're not charged with influencing a witness. We're charged with misleading the witness. The fact that the, I don't know if the General Assembly does it or Lexis does it, put a title on this statute, has misled this jury into thinking that the crime could mean the subject, that's Mr. MacGyver, just needs to be, I'm sorry, it's not, I, I take it back. The subject, meaning uh, Dan and Joe, just needs to be asked to do or say something. And the answer is no, that's not enough. It's not enough. They give, you, they give you two choices. One is arguably correct, and one is not. And you're going to tell them, for five days, you've had the jury instruction out there. Go read it. They've been reading it. You know they've been reading it. You know they're studying this stuff. And they've come up with a question that needs to be answered. And they deserve an answer, and we deserve them to have an answer, rather than hope that they choose the right one, because one of their options is wrong. Well, you know, you're convinced it's wrong. I'm not. If, if, if um, the jury is construing the evidence to be, Mr. McGuire says, you know what? You don't need to talk to the police. Um, in fact, you should just get out of here. I'm going to ask you to tell the police um, that you weren't there. I think that a jury could construe that to be misleading on Mr. MacGyver's part. He is lying to her, but it also could be misleading. He is attempting to mislead her that it's okay to get out of there, you don't need to be here, etc. And he asked her to just say something. Tell the police. Tell them that. Tell the jury that. As long as you find that what he did was misleading, you can return a verdict on count five. That's not the way I would phrase it. Okay. You must find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the, that the accused engaged in misleading conduct, not simply asked her to do, or not simply, or only asked her to do or say something. It must be in connection with an attempt, an intent to mislead. That's the question they've asked. They're entitled to an answer. We're entitled to an answer. For that matter, the state's entitled to have the jury properly and, uh, informed. Okay, and let me see if I can come up with something in connection with um, what we're calling question eight. Um, and I still think, and I kind of got distracted by the forcefulness of, of your focus here on, on question eight. Um, are you okay um, with me? Um, referring the jurors back to that collection of charges that will reorient them to intent and the this and that. As long as you begin with the answer, yes. The statute, the, the, the instructions, I'm sorry, let me, let me phrase it right. The crime of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon does require intent to assault with a deadly weapon. That's the first sentence. The second sentence, is please refer to page six and the supplemental instruction. Let me work on it. We'll see what I come up with. And
you'll get a chance to come back and hit the podium. All right, is Christ ready? Yes. Here's what I've written now. For question seven, I just wrote Q7. For an assault to occur, there must be an intent to commit a violent injury to another. It may assist you to review the charges for definition of a crime and intent on, and I go on to reference the charges we mentioned, excluding influencing a witness. Does that work for the defense? That's for question seven. Six and seven. Six and seven. Yes, sir. Does that work? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Mr. Rucker? And in this case, the assault must be committed by shooting her with a deadly weapon. Well, for an assault to occur, correct. there must be an intent to commit a violent injury to another. I could have added six more sentences about that. I have a deadly weapon and this and that. But the question was, and the definition is, an assault, um, wait for a minute. occurs when a person attempts to commit a violent injury to another. And the jurors are stuck, wait, there was an action. Is the action enough? The answer is no. Um, there must be an intent to commit a violent injury to another. Um, so I, I didn't dive deeper. We can. They don't seem to be struggling at all with how a deadly weapon weaves into it. Um, they seem to be walking the line. And we all thought they'd be walking in terms of accident, intent. Are the actions sufficient to show criminality right. or um, or not? And um, they ought to be told that there has to, they must find uh, that there was intent to commit the violent injury, not just to hold the gun or something like that. For question eight, I wrote, and that's the influencing witnesses question. For count five, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant engaged in misleading conduct towards Ms. Carter with the intent or goal of convincing her to withhold information from the police. Mr. Sandy. I mean, to Mr. Harvey's point, um, I could add um, the person doesn't actually need to be tricked into performing an action. I suspect you don't want that in there, but that is answering that question more fully. Needs to be tricked into. No, they don't need to be tricked. You're adding the word, at least 
you, you, you're helping by you, you're helping to define what your interpretation is by adding the word successful. Well, and that's that's what you're thinking they need, and I don't think that's what they need. I think they're they're they're, they're trying to figure out how to be tricked. But at any rate, I, I don't think your instruction is bad. I think it would be helpful if you could. I've got two requests. Sure. Get the word influencing out of this. Okay. And and explain to them that if that's the if that's the source of your confusion, please look at the instruction and not the title. Okay. That's one thing I would suggest. Okay. And then second, I would say um, there. It misleading requires. I, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not sure how to improve it. Just, okay. We, we got to send the answer to the General Assembly. Maybe we do. We do. The other ones, and the United States Congress. I'll stand by you on this one. 1512, they originally drafted this. It's going to help us with this one. Okay. Um, Judge, in your response on question eight, um, would the court, as it is, um, would you just answer that no period with your explanation? It, it's a two-part question, and at least one and a half of them, no would be the wrong answer. Well, so I don't think that's a so good idea. I don't need to be responding to well, correctly. No, you don't have to be tricked. Correct. That's you correct. have to intend to trick. That's but two different point. people. That's the point, is it's two different people. The speaker of the words has to be intending to mislead. Right. The recipient of the words could say, forget it. Right. That's crazy talk. Right. Stop trying to influence me. That's right. And I'm not going to go to the police. I'm not going to lie to the police. Right. Or I will go to the police. Whatever. Absolutely, I agree with that. Okay. But, but again, the original encounter must be misleading. No doubt about that. Well, otherwise it's coercion, intimidation, threatening, so killing, suborning perjury, all those other crimes with which we are not sure. There must be an effort to mislead, not that it actually is successful. Correct. Okay. But that, I'm with you on that. I'm with you too. Oh, we'll yeah. see. Let me, let me write one more sentence maybe to this. What if I add, I don't want to write it yet, only to have to tear, I wrote a lot on this page, I don't have to tear it up. Um, a second sentence to question eight. The speaker must intend to mislead. The hearer, the listener, the recipient, you can pick words to make it, need not be misled. You must intend to mislead the hearer. Yes, 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 yes. As opposed to the police. Correct. He actually has to intend to mislead both. Correct. But you're okay with that. I think that hit okay. That's right. All right. Um, do you need me to read either answer again? Please. Sure. So in response to questions six and seven, for an assault to occur, there must be an intent to commit a violent injury to another. It may assist you to review the charges or definition of a crime, intent, aggravated assault, and the intent scenarios. And I include the page references to the charge that all 12 of them have. In response to question eight, for count five, the state must prove beyond reasonable doubt that defendant engaged in misleading conduct toward Ms. Carter with the intent or goal of convincing her to withhold information from the police. The speaker must intend to mislead the hearer. The hearer need not actually be misled. Mr. Rucker, you all right with that? I'm okay with that. Instead of speaker and hearer, how about let's just say Mr. Defendant and, and Ms. Carter? Mr. Mr. McGyver and Ms. Carter. Okay. Thank you. Sure.
they can read Yes. Yeah, yeah. I need that back at some point. Should not destroy it. Thank you. Mr. Rucker, anything else before we transition back to Atlanta Peace Movers versus Mr. Holyfield? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Sam? Yes. Yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> So, Ms. Price, will keep you posted whenever the blue light comes back on. You ready, Ms. Price? Yes. I can read the question and then uh, you guys can look at it. Um, I think we're on question nine. We don't see a path to overcome our differences on the defendant's intent related to charges one, two, three, and five. Mr. Rucker, your thoughts about question nine? Um, I would note for the record, I believe the jurors <coughs> have been deliberating four and a half days. Yeah. Plus an hour. Yeah. Um, and the uh, case uh, took uh, several weeks to try many witnesses and many exhibits. Um, I believe that they are a conscientious jury. Um, and um, the court could perhaps consider an Allen charge at this time. I don't know um, if we have gotten to the place where they are hopelessly um, that locked the fact that they don't see a pathway. I think the court could instruct them to please continue uh, to make attempts and continue to, to deliberate. I think that would be appropriate. Um, I don't think that it's an unreasonable amount of time to have spent in deliberations given the complexities of the case, the amount of information that they've been presented. Um, I would note for the court doing voir dire. Um, most of the sitting jury does not have prior jury experience. And so I'm not surprised um, that uh, they would send out a note in that fashion at this point. And so before I think the court takes the extraordinary step of giving an Allen charge, I would ask the court to simply instruct them to please continue their deliberation to attempt to reach a unanimous verdict. Samuel, I know you're one person down, but we reach out to one number, we're supposed to be able to get everyone. Um, you want to at least give the collective wisdom of four of the five members of the team? No. How long do we have to wait for Mr. Harvey? He's, we just, he, he's here. He's in the courthouse. And then I've talked to his paralegal and Paige, his wife, just ran out and tracked down where they are. Okay, maybe the coffee shop. Just give us a minute. Okay, maybe the restaurant. Welcome. TMI, just need him back in here. I'm not sure if Paige will find Okay. We'll read this just for Mr. Harvey. Question nine. We don't see a path to overcome our differences on the defendant's intent related to charges one, two, three, five. Discuss. I'll go back to the discussion. Do you mind if you want me to get my no, I don't mind. Just talk with Mr. Samuel and uh, Ms. Clark Palmer. They are anxious to hear your thoughts. All right, defense, what are we thinking? <laughs> Bruce has the answer. I'm glad he came back. So I heard two different requests from the state. It was Allen charge and then, well, maybe not yet, um, do more deliberating than Allen charge. Um, and Mr. Harvey, it was put on the record uh, before you got here. Uh, it's been four and a half days plus hour plus on that first day of deliberation. So no small amount, but we juxtapose that against the long trial. So um, I certainly agree that they've been deliberating for a long time in a thoughtful manner. And this question, question nine, it should be observed, comes on the heels of the juror saying, we're stuck with intent. We don't you need to do this or that? And in response to apparently an answer that didn't provide solutions, um, they came back with uh, 
this observation. There's not a right or wrong answer. There's just a response from the defense. I'm right. That's a right or wrong answer. Yes. Um, I think the response is just a, um, a admonition for them to continue to deliver. Um, we'll see where we are. And uh, I, I guess the question is how much more do we allow them to deliberate before there are other perhaps motions that need to be considered. Deputy Murphy, have they had lunch yet? I know they haven't. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to share with the jurors um, that they need to continue uh, their deliberations after they have a lunch break. I am going to inform them that um, uh, they should remain thoughtful, consider each count individually. Uh, that they should uh, consider lesser included offenses. They um, may ultimately uh, come back with a verdict provided that it is unanimous as to not all the counts, but just some of the counts. Uh, but with those things in mind, after they have a lunch break, they should um, resume their deliberations and let us know later this afternoon um, what's going on. Any issue with that? Mr. Rucker? No, does the court intend to keep them together during the lunch break? I let them do it. If they want it to be a working lunch, it can be a working lunch. If they don't want it to be a working lunch, then they, they go in their directions okay. as they have in the past. Okay. But you're saying, I, I, in that kind of offer kind of, kind of response, I don't mean that. The Allen charge is a very specific charge. It's very carefully calibrated to be balanced, to insist on proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know why you start telling them to consider lesser included now. There's no indication that they are anywhere near that kind of discussion. I don't know. I don't agree with what you just said. If you're going to do something other than continue to deliberate, then we need to talk about it. Very carefully crafted, balanced, Allen charge, which spawns more litigation at this point of trial, and it just kind of wing it. Again, I don't mean that until anyway, but it's a mistake at this point. It's, it's, it shouldn't be done. So, um, I want to make sure I'm following what you're saying. You're saying that the Allen charge itself continues to spawn endless litigation, or you're saying you need to be thoughtful because if you um, vary too far from either get back to work or the Allen charge, then you're in a gray area that um, would spawn litigation. A lot. When you start monkeying with an Allen charge <clears throat> is when you have problems. <clears throat> an Allen charge, if done by the book, you know, it's going to pass muster. But from what you were saying, it didn't sound like you were close to being an Allen charge. It wasn't, wasn't meant to be. And, and pointing out, you know, you know, pick a few counts maybe. It, it just sounds like you're, it, to me, it sounds like you're saying, you know, think about some compromises here, which is exactly what you're not supposed to do with an Allen charge. So I wouldn't do that, Judge. Not, not without writing it out for us, letting us look at it, let's compare it to an Allen charge, let's see if it's got mistakes in it, uh, or meanings one way or the other. So I, 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 I'm hearing you. I'm trying to understand what's improper with letting jurors know that um, they can reach a verdict as to some, all, or none of the counts. It is none. Well, you, you say that. You well, they said they have a problem with one, two, three, and five. I don't know what four is, how that fits into the mix, but they've already said they can't reach a verdict. Why are you telling them, go ahead and find out one or two of them, or three of them? Right? They've already said they can't. <laughs> in, in contrast to saying, we're, we're struggling some with intent, they actually battled off all the charges that, I mean, four has to flow from one, two, or three, or you don't have four. So I get why they didn't put four in there. We hope. Right, right. Okay. I'm just looking at the Allen charge now. <clears throat> so 
So, Mr. Rucker, tell me your thinking as to why um, we don't get to the Allen charge now. I mean, appreciate the graduated approach. This is the first time the jurors are saying we're stuck. Right. It's also after almost five days of deliberating. Right. How much? How long do they have to be stuck in your mind? And that's not a fair question, but why not give the Allen charge now? Um, well, Judge, you know. There's no crystal ball. We are trying to interpret uh, what's happening um, uh, within the jury room. And so, you know, there were um, some questions at the very beginning. We know that the jurors did some work Thursday and Friday. As late as Friday afternoon, they wanted to continue to work, thought they were making progress. They came back this morning with um, questions that seem to indicate we'd like some clarification with respect to intent. Um, it's only been roughly about an hour and 15 minutes or so, maybe even a little bit less, since the court has responded to that last question. And I believe what the court said, um, the, the last note we got says that we don't see a pathway to resolving. And so um, I, I don't hear that to be we are hopelessly deadlocked. I hear that to say exactly what it says. We don't see a pathway. And as I stated to the court earlier, uh, I don't believe these are jurors who have a great deal of prior jury service to understand um, the application perhaps of facts to uh, law in order to come to conclusions. And so, before we got to the Allen charge, and as much as this is the first indication we have that there is an inability to kind of resolve some of the counts in the indictment, my suggestion was to encourage them to continue to deliberate, but perhaps after coming back from lunch. I need to correct one thing, not that you said, but that I've been saying uh, another proof that I am bad. They've been deliberating for three and a half days. I had sort of fantasized that actually you guys did closings on Monday, but of course, Tuesday. Right, Tuesday was closings, so they had a little bit of time on Tuesday to deliberate. It was all day Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right. half a day today. So three and a half days is still a long time, um, but that's less than a day per week of trial. I don't know that that's the ratio, but uh, um, it's three and a half, almost three and three quarters days now that they've been deliberating. Mr. Samuel, anything else, or, or Mr. Harvey, or Mr. Baltimore, you want to add? No? I think what we've already covered. Okay. All right, I'm going to go print this out so <laughs> you all can look at it. It's basically the Allen charge. To go. The they and them and maybe you because I'm talking to the jurors and not people not in the room. Um, but let me get copies for you all to look at and uh, we can discuss. You go, Ms. Lamb. Get that to everyone. to look at the language of the proposed charge? Are you still looking at it? I looked at it. I was looking at Allen, but yes, I've seen it. I, back in the day, I thought it said something along the lines of, hey, there's no reason to think you want the best jurors ever, and so why should we think the next jury would do any better? It's not in there. I didn't add it. I just sort of thought that was kind of a long, fuzzy, uplifting language, but apparently someone didn't like it and it won out. That's right. Oh, that is the 11th Circuit where they uplift the jurors and empower them. Okay. Well, I said over your other 11th Circuit stuff, so um, that's not where we are. Uh, Mr. Samuel, did you have a chance to um, look at this, and do you have uh, any concerns? Uh, we have some concerns. Okay. Unless I'm missing something, I don't see anything in here that talks about necessity of establishing guilt beyond a reasonable doubt in the different elements. Uh, it's 
especially given their apparent inability to solve the issue of one critical element of four counts of uh, well, we have four counts of the indictment. Um, if I can refer to the 11th Circuit Pact, that includes language other than what you were just talking about. That if they, and if you send the 11th, um, I, I'm not opposed to your notion. I, I did not, I'll be mean, really clear for the record, I did not omit any language from the pattern charge that said, hey, the state's burden of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. I'm not in any way trying to lessen that. It's not in there. That doesn't mean I won't add it, but that's not something I cut out. Coming your way. Great. I mean, it's got problems too. Well, I wasn't going to accept it wholesale, but if there are parts to import, Murphy, do you know, is our inmate here and up? Any idea? We have at 1 o'clock a hearing involving an inmate. Oh, no, he's not up here, sir. Is he in the building? Uh, yes, sir. Great. You get it? Nope, I got something. Uh, maybe Ms. Lyon got it, and she's sending it to me. We'll see. Oh, here it is. Great. Got it. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at it. I have read it. Maybe what I'll do is um, pull a few parts of it uh, out. Um, but I've also just looked at the Georgia Supreme Court opinion, Burchett, that says, don't say there's not going to be a better jury out there. Um, so all those uplifting things, even though they sound uplifting, um, my boss's box has said don't do that. Yeah. So um, I can't um, put that in. But um, for example, you must also remember that if the evidence fails to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant must have your unanimous verdict of not guilty. Something like that probably ought to be in there. I think so. Let me clue the two together. Which the state has already, the state has already pointed out that it's possible is there, and 
in the context of the full charge, that that sentence is not coercive either way, that it's perfectly acceptable, and that uh, the state would just try to get as closely as possible to the pattern charge in an effort to avoid unnecessary error. So uh, we're just asking the court to consider changing that one sentence to the, the language of the pattern charge. Apart from that, Your Honor, I don't believe we have any objection to the slight addition to the end of the pattern charge, which is the keeping in mind referencing earlier charges this court has given. Um, I believe that's it for the state for now, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Who will be speaking for the defense as to whether there's anything that should be added or subtracted from what I'm going to share with the jurors when they emerge? Are they back, Deputy Murphy? Yes, sir. Are our jurors back? Uh, there was there was a not all of them when I stepped away from it. Okay. Much. If you don't mind checking, that'd be great. Yes, they are okay, sir. Okay. Defense, anything else? If not, we unfortunately didn't come up with any brilliant ideas over the 45 minute break. But we had, the problem actually is that we had many of them that they were diverging. So, <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Lyon did point me. Um, uh, towards uh, a case in which the case is Romine, R-O-M-I-N-E, in which the judge used the ABA version of an Allen charge, and I got the text of that, at least that which was used in Romine. It's not all that different. It's not worth even diving into it. It didn't have a magic formulation that the Georgia Supreme Court has said, okay, is okay, that I thought would get us to it. Um, more um, jury-friendly formulation than what we've got in front of us now. So I stepped back from Romine 256, Georgia 521. I didn't think it advanced things at all. That was all I came up with. You like I saw the Romine, but we'd like with no juror should surrender an honest I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. No juror should surrender an honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence merely solely because of the opinion of other jurors, but that's implicit in what you read. And it's in what I've already read them and they've got in front of them that I am incorporating explicitly now at the end of this instruction. Yeah. I don't have the same problem that the state has with the, <coughs> the, uh, with the sense that they've um, changed from what you offered. Having not read the case, but having had it described, it sounds like that case dealt specifically with the issue of what Mr. Harvey said, which is, you're not required to reach a verdict. You're not. That <coughs> did that in the case where in the Southern District of Georgia, the 11th Circuit said, you can't tell the jury that. I mean, the fact that that's not required to reach a verdict. Right. I'm going to, um, what I propose to say in lieu of the sentence that Mr. Wakeford started talking about is any verdict as to any count must be unanimous. That's an accurate statement of all. I believe it is too. Um, and you all, do you need me to read again what comes after the comma, after the word verdict at the very end, or have I read it enough times that you're okay with it? State? Keeping in mind the charges I have previously given you as to verdict proof, elements of the crimes charged, and other matters, substantially not. That, that's like 98% of it's no other words. I think I use singular rather than plural ones. Not requirement of proof beyond reasonable doubt. Well, I say burden of proof. I think that that is sufficiently um, reflective of one of the points they um, have heard many times um, that is central to the charge that I am reincorporating <coughs> with that last clause. Let's bring these 12 jurors out, please.
All rise for the jurors.
Um, but we're going to leave the jurors alone for the time being to see what, if anything, happens in light of my instructions today. Thanks for your patience. Did they ever say how late they want to stay today, or they didn't realize that was done? I didn't ask them, so I, I don't know. Um, I will certainly have Deputy Murphy check on their well being um, soon enough. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Price. We'll let you know. What's next?